Hello and welcome to the SolarWinds MSP Ransomware Protection Webinar Series. This is part one titled, Is Backup Enough? My name is Eric Harless. I'm a Senior Product Manager with SolarWinds MSP with responsibilities for the SolarWinds Backup and Recovery products. This is a two-part webinar series. Today we will cover part one, Is Backup Enough? We'll start by understanding the threat of ransomware. We will look at the different types of ransomware. We'll investigate if backup really is enough when it comes to ransomware protection. And finally, we'll conclude with the five steps to ransomware protection. Later, in part two, ready for recovery, we will dive deeper into how you can ensure that SolarWinds backup is there as your last line of defense against data loss due to ransomware. We'll look at some examples of data loss due to ransomware. We'll discuss proper planning, preparation, and testing to ensure recovery from ransomware. And finally, we'll look at factors involved in determining whether to pay a ransom or recover from a successful backup. To start, what is ransomware? Well, it's a software-based attack on your network and systems with a goal of extortion. Always money, and almost always Bitcoin. How is ransomware spread? Well, it's typically delivered through an exploit kit or a phishing attack. Once delivered, recent variants can even self-propagate throughout your network. You might ask, what is an exploit kit? Well, that's malicious code written specifically to take advantage of an unpatched or unknown system or application vulnerability. An example could be an unpatched vulnerability in Adobe Flash, your internet browser, a web server, your OS, Java, or Adobe Reader, for example. It's this reason that we want you to ensure that your applications and your OS are patched regularly and always up to date. What is phishing? Well, that's an email sent by a malicious entity pretending to be a legitimate communication with the intent to breach an organization's cyber defenses. Now, perhaps it's an email attachment or a link to a bogus site or even a URL to a legitimate site that's been compromised by hackers. There are at least three common variants of ransomware. Uh, first, it's your COP or locker variant. Uh, this hijacks your system while browsing. It may prevent access to your system, but doesn't actually destroy or typically doesn't destroy or encrypt any of your data. You may be requested to pay a fine to regain access to your system or your environment, and malware tools can help prevent and or clean this type of infection. Now, backup is still your last line of defense here if cleaning doesn't resolve the issue. Second are cryptographic variants. These will encrypt selected files, folders, volumes, shares, or systems, preventing access to your data, and they will demand a fee to unlock them. Backup is still your last line of defense with this variant if you don't plan on paying that ransom. Third, uh, if a system or its data is taken hostage, then the bad guys have allegedly captured sensitive data from your system and they are threatening to use that against you in some way if you don't pay the ransom. This could be by sharing it with your contacts or posting it to the web or grabbing your credit card or, or other personal information and utilizing it. This may be combined with other threats as well, but in this case, backup by itself is just not enough. So ransomware has evolved significantly over the last two decades, as you can see here from just some examples of the various variants that are out there. They'll continue to evolve with new variants, new threats, continue to be self-propagating and self-replicating, using bogus and legitimate sources. Uh, they'll continue to be destructive to your data and your infrastructure. They are constantly evolving, so you need to keep up with your patches, your updates, your AV, and your backups to ensure that you are protected. Now, you don't have to be a victim of a successful ransomware attack to have data loss. Even a failed attempt after step one below can wreak havoc with your data. Now, a successful attack is the following. It's a um, variant taking control of your system or device. It's number two, preventing access to that device and its data to some degree. Now, at this point, you're impacted. Whether it gets any further or not, you could be in need of AV cleaning software or your backup to perform a restore. Now, a successful attempt is also then going to inform you that you are being held ransom, and it's going to present a method of payment to you. Now, this is where you want to start looking to see, do you have a good backup in place? You know, having a good backup in place is the difference between recovery of your environment or paying the ransom or having a significant data loss event. Now, number four, after payment is received from the user, uh, typically um, the, uh, the ransomer um, should return full access of the device to you once that payment is received, uh, whether it means by disabling the, um, uh, the locker uh, or the cryptographic software or you know, no longer sharing or threatening to share your information with others. Now, just because you've paid the ransom, however, it does not always guarantee that you're going to get access to your data, access to your system, or that they're not going to use that data against you in some way, shape, or form. Uh, there is no honor among thieves when it comes to ransomware. 
So once you're impacted, what does a compromised device look like? Well, it comes in all shapes and sizes. It could be a desktop background change, a pop-up window, or just seeing that your files uh, are now uh, not opening and they've got strange file names. There's now text files in each of your directories. Um, they're all going to have demands of you, uh, whether it's to pay a fine, uh, to gain access, or a fee, or you lose all of your data, or they want you to pay an increasing fee that, that uh, um, gets larger over time, encouraging you to act quickly. Maybe they want you to pay a fee, uh, or increments of your data are going to be destroyed over time. And then finally, uh, they may want you to pay a fee just to prevent personal data or personal information from being released to the public or to your, your email contact list. Now, backup has been around for quite a while, and it can successfully help a lot of organizations recover from ransomware, at least for all but uh, number five of the demand list here. You know, if they're not looking to encrypt your data and they're just looking to release it, um, there's other steps you need to take in order to prevent that. But as you, you understand, ransomware is a growing illicit business. Malware developers are getting smarter. They're trying to identify and negate your AV and your anti-malware software. They're trying to delete your backups and your snapshots. So as they get smarter over time, uh, I would expect these demands to grow and then to get more and more creative about how they try to get you to pay that ransom. Let's discuss the detailed progression of a ransomware attack. It all starts once a ransomware Trojan package is executed. Now, even if you have updated AV, it may not help you here, especially if it's a new variant or new strain of malware. This is the point where education may be more important than technology. Educate your customers and users on what to look for. Uh, now, few operating systems are safe. Many current ransomware variants will work on Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux systems. Gone are the days of security by obscurity. The Trojan reaches out to one or more locations to download its payload. If you're lucky, then your security software or your firewall may prevent this connection. Now, since encryption doesn't happen all at once, it may take several hours or even days to encrypt the data, uh, and the ransomware doesn't want to get caught during this process. So the Trojan may delete itself. Uh, some AV softwares and security softwares might uh, be damaged or disabled to help prevent updates and reporting of the malware. Some AV software may see the attempt to encrypt data and block the process before it causes too much harm. Now, if not, the payload is going to then encrypt files using a secure algorithm. It's going to look to various locations and file types. Uh, some common ones that are targeted include locally stored office documents, image files, video files, etc. Uh, maybe they're going to look at network shares and the users that have access to those. It's going to look at connected external drives such as USB hard drives and thumb drives. It may also look at cloud storage such as uh, users that write or synchronize data between uh, third-party solutions like Dropbox or Google Drive. Be on the lookout for unexpected bandwidth usage or higher than normal CPU and RAM utilization as a potential sign that the system is uh, encrypting data in the background. With a ransomware infection, volume snapshot services, VSS, or shadow copies, and some backup applications and their repositories are commonly corrupted or deleted. The goal is they don't want you to be able to recover from your backups. Eventually, you'll get a wallpaper, a pop-up, or a screen overlay that alerts the user that the system has been encrypted and instructs the user to pay a fine or fee, often via Bitcoin, a virtually untraceable online currency, and those fees are going to vary considerably depending on the type or variant of the infection. At this point, it's often too late to stop the infection on the current device, so really now all you can do is isolate that machine immediately and then look at the rest of the network to see if there are other systems that are impacted, and then of course isolate those as well. Ultimately, if a ransom is paid, a decryption key is generally returned, and often data is potentially restored. There is, however, no honor among thieves, and it's not guaranteed that if you pay a ransom that your data will be decrypted and returned to you. So how does one decide to recover versus pay that ransom? Well, just because you have a backup, it doesn't mean that you're safe. It doesn't mean you can recover. Let me repeat that. Just because you have a backup doesn't mean you're safe. If you're impacted by ransomware, don't make an immediate knee-jerk reaction. Why? Well, because even if you think you have a backup, not all backups are created equal and users make mistakes. If your system or systems are impacted, start by isolating and inventorying the systems so that you know what's at risk and what the value of the data that is compromised is compared to the cost of the ransom. Identify the threat, and if it's a known threat or a new one, you've got various options. Now, patch the hole if you can to prevent further outbreak. But don't do anything destructive on the impacted systems. That means running cleaners or anything else that might prevent you or your customer's ability to later pay that ransom if they choose to do so. At least not until you know your options. Inventory your backup. 
Check your backup history to ensure that you have good backups of the right data for the impacted systems and that they are current and up to date as of the time of the outbreak. I'd suggest to do a test restore to new hardware or a virtual environment just to prove that the data is there before taking any other extreme actions. If in doubt, contact your backup vendor for assistance. But I have a backup. Well, you have a backup, that's great, but when was the last successful session? Do you know? Are you actually monitoring all of your systems? Well, if the last success was over 14 or even 30 days ago, the customer might opt to pay that ransom to get back the more recent copies of the data. They also might opt to find a new backup provider once everything is resolved. When was the last time you looked for new systems on the network or checked the selection list to ensure proper coverage? Finding out you missed a directory or an entire server after a data loss is the wrong time. How far can you go back? Did you retain backups or archives from before the infection? Well, let's say a partner doesn't discover that some files are still missing or they're still encrypted until three months after initially recovering from a ransomware attack. What would you do? But I have a backup. Well, you've got a backup, that's great, but maybe you don't. You know, many consumers and small businesses incorrectly assume that sync and share applications like Google Drive are backups. In reality, these types of applications are susceptible to the same type of deletions, corruptions, and encryptions that impact production data on your local system. Even with versioning, these applications aren't designed for mass restores of a single point in time, and normally only a subset of data is synchronized to the sync and share cloud. But I have a backup. Well, it's great that you have a backup, but where is it? What is it? Are you relying on native local backups or VSS or virtual machine snapshots? These are just some of the first types of backups that get damaged or deleted by the latest ransomware variants. Backup data on a local volume or USB drive on an unsecured NAS or network share can be encrypted right along with the production data and often is. To really be protected, you need an offsite copy or a hybrid data protection solution. What I want you to understand is while a great tool, backup is proactive and recovery is reactive. It is your last line of defense after you've exhausted all other lines of offense and defense when combating ransomware. Backup alone is often not enough. It is only one of five or more key steps to protecting your customer data from loss due to ransomware. Remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. At a glance, here are those steps. Start by working with customers, employees, users to educate and restrict access to non-essential systems, resources, and data. Institute prevention measures such as antivirus, anti-malware, patch, and web security tools. Ensure backup and recovery tools are in place, monitored, and tested. Finally, we recommend strong firewall and network security implementations along with vulnerability, auditing, and risk assessment to know what kind of data you're protecting and what kind of data is at risk. Step one, a lot of ransomware relies on social engineering. Convincing a user to ignore his training and click a link or open a URL or attachment. Arm your users with the knowledge that they need to recognize and avoid these threats. It's hard to capture the castle if the enemy can't get through the gate. Help users understand and be wary of macros and office documents masquerading as fake invoices or pending legal actions. Start by not enabling macros unless you actually use them. Use Active Directory to block macros and files received from the internet. Consider using Microsoft viewers instead of full applications when in doubt. A suspect attachment, when opened, may appear garbled or encrypted and instruct the user to enable macros. This lets the infection begin. Help users identify common phishing attempts and have them look closely at attachments before opening. Creative naming techniques can mask the file type. To prevent this, you may want to unhide known extensions to give users visibility and prevent execution of files that are falsely named. In this example, a JavaScript file is named to look like a zip file because the .js extension is hidden. Once you click, the infection begins. Start by using your firewalls and AV software to blacklist known risky and malicious sites. Educate your users to be wary of links using short URLs and on how to identify fake or copycat websites. These sites may have embedded JavaScript code that can start an infection. Step 2. Set up access restrictions. Ransomware typically piggybacks on the logged in user account. Not everyone needs admin level access all the time, even the admins. Use run as and enter credentials as needed. Prevent admins from using email accounts, 
restrict user access to the backup share and to network locations they don't need, limit the use of map drives and map shares, and when used, always use security. Consider workgroup or resource level security and authenticate each time you connect. Step 3. Traditional signature-based AV is often not enough. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Invest in anti-malware alongside traditional AV or use a solution that offers both. AV must be able to stop processes that are acting maliciously. Enforce inbound mail scanning and blocking. AV must be on all the time with no ability to be disabled by the end user. Updates should happen automatically and frequently in the background. Look to web content filtering solutions as an additional tool to increase effectiveness. Step 4. Patch Management. Upgrade or migrate from end-of-life operating systems and browsers. Unpatched systems are often open doors for ransomware delivery. So implement central monitoring to report on unpatched systems. Automate your patching so that it's applied within a short time following release. And schedule regular maintenance windows to accommodate patch and system reboots. Patching is more than just your operating system. Third-party software must be monitored and patched. Don't let users ignore the updates. If in doubt, remove old applications and restrict ability for users to install all but authorized applications. Step 5. Backup is your last line of defense. It may be your only option if steps 1 through 4 have failed and you need to restore. Now make sure you're backing up the right data. If you don't protect it, you can't restore it. Replication, sync and share, local VSS or VM snapshots are often not enough. They can easily be deleted by the ransomware. Make sure that you have off-site and cloud copies of your backup data. If the local copy is encrypted or destroyed, then you still have the off-site copy. Restrict user access to the backup application and any local or network data repositories. Frequently test your backups and restores to ensure that you know you're protected and that you understand the recovery process. Look into advanced firewall and network security. Deploy a firewall that will block threats based on a threat intel feed that offers sandboxing that can please user interaction with websites that are not whitelisted. For example, they ask you or query you to proceed. Standardize on a set of egress rules and network segmentation, i.e. no printers on the internet. Run vulnerability audits and risk assessment tools. Know where your weak points are and what data is potentially at risk so you can correct it. Address issues and rerun those audits regularly to look for broken procedures and user mistakes. Consider employing cyber breach insurance with your customers. As we start to conclude this session, I want you to remember ransomware is not just one of many cyber threats. It's an ever-growing business and revenue stream for hackers, which you and your customers need to be prepared for and protected against. I encourage you to use the publicity that ransomware is getting in the news to you and your customers' advantage. Educate and inform your users of the threats and begin to build out the necessary services to both protect against and recover from ransomware. So that concludes today's presentation. I want to thank you for your time and attention. Please visit www.solarwindsmsp.com to learn more about our various solutions that help combat ransomware. And please tune back in for part two of this series where we go through more advanced topics on how to configure and secure SolarWinds backup to combat and recover from ransomware. Thank you and have a great day.